Good morning, it's Monday the 27th of February 2012. Chris Redden with today's United Kingdom talk. I'm sorry, Catholics everywhere who have given up something for Lent, I'm afraid I have already fallen off the wagon and eaten Walker's cheese and onion crisps. I'm very, very sorry. I'm very, very sorry. Uh, one of the reasons, there can be no excuse, but I shall give one anyway. Uh, one of the reasons was uh, Saturday night this week, I was DJing at the, um, uh, at that, uh, uh, do you remember that job I took on a couple of weeks ago? I was really quite unsure of. Uh, well, it actually worked quite well and it, I got some more bookings in there. So I was DJing at this place on Saturday night. And it was quite quite a late night, 10 till 4. Very um, sort of house orientated music. I don't know if you'd like it. I mean, it's all very... It's all a bit like that, really. But uh, what a fantastic night. My God. What an absolutely fantastic night. I actually took my top off while I was DJing as well. I mean, that gave them a few shocks. I'm sure it did. But a fantastic night. Unfortunately, uh, because at four o'clock in the morning and I'm in the car and I'm thinking, oh, God, how am I going to get home? You know, because it it's an hour's drive for me on the way home. Fortunately, I don't drink or anything like that, so that's OK. But I was quite tired at four o'clock. So I'm afraid I had to open one or two packets of cheese and onion, where it was actually a cheese and onion crisps, salt and vinegar crisps, and smoky bacon crisps because they were in one of those multi-pack things. And they were they were they were actually were they walk they weren't walkers actually they were discos, which are kind of little like round crisps there and they're quite strong flavour. So I'm very very sorry. I have fallen off the wagon. Less than a week, I lasted not eating crisps. I, I shall just pick up again and start again. What do you think, eh? There's nothing wrong with trying again, is there? I will continue to try and give up crisps for Lent. As I found at the weekend. I do apologise, Catholics everywhere. Uh, talking of the weekend, what a beautiful weekend it's been here in the UK. Oh, absolutely beautiful weekend. Did I say week? Weekend. Saturday, sun is shining. I've gone over to Forest for a good hour's walk. I've been going over there a lot lately, sort of, you know, it's, it's quite nice. Um, walking through like a park or a forest and you kind of get your thoughts together. You know, it's all very well going over there on a bicycle and like tearing around the place. But when you go over somewhere for sort of, you know, reasonably gentle walk, it's so nice to sort of just collect your thoughts together, you know. Maybe have a little sit on the bench halfway, halfway around. So I was good over there a good an hour. And then Sunday... Sunday, uh, I got up, and that's the other thing, you know, even though you have a late night, sort of Saturday night, Sunday morning, I didn't get to bed till about quarter past five. But you still wake up at the same time, don't you? What's all that about? Still woke up at the same time, so I woke up and thought, oh, I don't want to get up. Yeah, but I got, once I'm awake, um, I can't get back to sleep again. Are you like that? Can you get back to sleep? So I had to get up and got on with all my things. But um, the sun was shining. It was a beautiful day Sunday, right? So I went outside, and as I looked outside, I suddenly realised something that hadn't crossed my mind. The very fact that I've removed my shed that was in the garden. Uh, if you were watching the show back in September last year, you will know that I had a very large shed in the garden. It's always been here since I moved here. And eventually, uh, back in August, September, I decided to, to take this shed down. So we filmed it all and all that. It was quite funny, that was. Um, took the shed down. And so it's just like, you know, an area that was going to grow vegetables in. But it seems that an added bonus, as an added bonus, something I didn't think of was that that part of the garden gets the sun reasonably early in the morning. I say reasonably early because I don't have a south-facing garden. My garden is kind of west. I think it's southeast or I can't remember now. It's not south-facing. So I usually because of the positioning of the shed, which I didn't realise before, I don't really get to sit in the garden in the sunshine till about 12.30 in the afternoon. By then it's come over the roof and it's hitting that part of the garden. Well, of course, now the shed isn't there. I've got this whole extra bit 
and the sun actually hits there at about 10.30 in the morning. So it was all very nice. And believe it or not, end of February, like I say, we're still in the middle of winter here in the UK. I went out and sat in the sunshine with my T-shirt off, boys, because I was topless in my garden. I know you're probably hoping now that I'm going to show you one or two pictures of me being topless, aren't you? Eh? You naughty people. I'm afraid I'm, we're not doing any nudity on this family-based programme. We can't do that. So it was all very nice. I don't know if uh, anyone else uh, in the UK watching the show managed to get out in the sunshine, but to actually sit in the garden at the end of February and not cold, not cold. The only time it got cold was when a cloud came over the sun. It's always rather disappointed when that happens and immediately all the warmth has gone. But while the sun was shining and I must have been out there a good hour, I don't know, do, do I look like I've got a bit of a tan today, I wonder? I just, I just laid, it was beautiful, I laid on there, the cat, Katie the cat jumped on my lap, we just laid there for a good hour in this sunshine, so, so very, very nice indeed. Uh, after that, um, I've uh, planted my first lot of onions in my vegetable plot. Yes, yes I have. I've planted, first time I've done them, I've planted onions. I made two rows of onions going, there's, there's enough there for at least another two or three rows. But I thought to myself, well, if you plant them all at the same time, they're all going to come up at the same time. And then what are you going to do with all these onions? So I've kind of planted two rows. And it says, I think you can plant them from February, February to May. So I'll leave four weeks now, I think. And then I shall plant another two rows and uh, hopefully that will see me uh, quite nice. I've never done onions before. They're, they're like uh, kind of mini onions, really. Uh, do we have any onion growers listening to the show? These, these little onions, they're, they're like very small onions and you put them about six centimetres into the ground. Now, do you, I mean, I've got no idea. Do you get one onion? Does that small onion just grow into a big one? Or do you get lots of onions from that one onion? Because I really haven't got a clue. Please let me know the answer to this question. My email address is chris at unitedkingdomtalk.co.uk. All right. Tell me, help me with my onions. What else has happened? I think that's all. Oh, the new house. The house I'm trying to buy at the moment. Um, apparently, we seem to be involved in a bit of a chain at the moment. So the person I'm buying from has put in an offer on a house. But the person that he's buying hasn't got anywhere to go to yet. Do you see what I mean? So we're involved in a bit of a chain with this house buying uh, business at the moment. So that's not happening. So we're, it's, all, it's all waiting, isn't it? Buying a house. It just takes forever, doesn't it? I've been trying to buy somewhere since October. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Not quite uh, right yet. I'm running at about 75, 80% now. I still don't feel completely right after that episode of flu uh, a week or so ago now, but I suppose it all takes time, doesn't it? Okay. Emails. Uh, Phil sent this on the 8th of February. So you had a long wait, Phil. Uh, who says... Breaker, breaker, one for Matchbox, you old poof. Have you got your ears on this Huckleberry Hound? Come on. Old poof. Old poof. Do you know, you're not the only one who said that. I had one of the, uh, uh, the assistant manager of the pub that I work at, or that, that I've been doing uh, a couple of Saturday nights doing uh, playing house music all night long uh, in Clapham. And uh, his name's John, otherwise known as Skinny Minnie. And he rang me up on Saturday, Sunday and he said, well, I just wanted to say you played a really good set last night. You, ne you haven't done bad for an old girl. I said, I beg your pardon, old girl? What do you mean? He said, well, uh, uh, well, no, he didn't. He said, old bird. I said, what do you mean, old bird? What a bloody cheek. Calling me an old bird like that. Yes, it was a good night. No need to call me an old bird. Dear me. Besides, I'm going to live longer than you, I think. Aren't I? Me and John are in sort of competition at the moment with something. At the moment, he's winning. But I, I think that in, over the next few months, I think, Skinny Mini, I'm going to win. I really do. Anyway, back to this email. 
Uh, Phil says, so you run out of emails? Well, I did a couple of weeks ago, yes. He said, well, you didn't read my last one out regards my age and music tastes. See if you read this one. Well, if I didn't read it out, I can't have got it, to be honest, Phil. Perhaps you'd like to, if you've still got it, send it again. I don't know where that went. He says, so you're back on the chicken box. Auntie Mary, Foxy Mama, or Simple Simon's Bum. AM, FM, single sidebands. No, I'm on FM. FM, CB operator. Oh, I've put my aerial up. Would you have a look, 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 look. those of you watching the show, here here's comes a few, few pictures of my brand new CB aerial attached to the side of my house. Look at this. Isn't that wonderful? Look how big that is. Just a few different views of the uh, of the aerial coming. That is an Antron 99. OK, it's called an Antron 99, my CB aerial. Phil says, I must admit, I got my gear, but can't put whip up living in a flat. That's it. Whip is his, his aerial. Uh, but might be moving soon. So I get CB stuff up and running again. However, I do have a full ham radio license. Oh, you must be a clever person then. And I did my Morse code, which I learned via a Spectrum computer. Oh, the Sinclair Spectrum. I had one of those. That old rubber keyboard. <laughs> I even wrote a couple of programs in basic. They're only silly things like would well, count down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and then lights would start flashing. It would make a noise. And uh, oh, well, I didn't do Morse code. I could do SOS. Please, I know I, I'm not. I'm not sending out an S. I'm just giving you a demonstration of it. S. O. S. Is that the right one? <laughs> he says um, a Class B license. You didn't need Morse. But you were not allowed to use the HF bands, i.e. below 50 megahertz. Now, you're just talking beyond me now. I don't understand this. Uh, you had to do Morse for all bands lower than 50 megahertz, an A license. OK. The reason, as I understood, was in case uh, of people who only use Morse code could ask you to move to a different frequency. You had to understand that some bands were share. And as hams amateurs, you didn't have priority. And if asked Morse, you were obliged to move. Hope this clears up the reason for Morse. I'd love to get my gear up and running again soon. There's, some, there's something very special about having a, a you know a ham radio or CB radio or anything like that. And you know you get your microphone, you get your aerial, and you speak to random people miles away. It, it's just it's not the same as being on Skype or on a mobile phone or something like that. It's, it's, it's just wonderful to, to push that button and send out a radio wave and for someone to answer and have a conversation like that. I can't, I can't explain what it is. I can't explain it. He says, been listening to some of your recent shows and heard the one about shooting giraffes. What bastards? Oh, yeah, that's an old show, that is. Yeah, it's an awful, awful story we covered a, a few weeks ago now. Um, about uh, someone who runs these so-called hunting. It's not really hunting at all, is it? You know, giraffes hardly, you know, can hardly hide, really. And uh, people were going to, I can't even remember what country it was now, they were going to some country somewhere, paying thousands of pounds for the privilege of shooting dead a giraffe. No reason for it. They just wanted to shoot a giraffe, uh, you know, not for food or anything. Ju 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 just uh, that's fun. I, 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 it's dreadful, isn't it? I hate to say it, that is fun to some people to shoot dead a live animal for no reason at all. And then they would uh, what they would do. I haven't got the pictures with me now. They would sit down next to this beautiful animal and have their picture taken. And they, they think this is a wonderful thing. I think it's sick. I think it's horrible. Phil says the only animal I would shoot is these vicious little and big dogs that attack children. All oh, those things. Don't tell me about it. I get really knocked when people say my dog won't, won't hurt you. Oh, how many times have we heard that one? You ever been out somewhere and this dog is straining at the lead, barking its head off, and the owner says, it's all right, they won't hurt you. 
My friend Justin's got two black Labradors. Now, I don't usually have a problem with dogs, but for some reason, one of them has taken a real dislike to me, and it sits there barking its bloody head off. And I'm scared. And he says, oh, it's all right. He won't hurt you. Take the bloody dog away. It's not right. It's not fair. I'm a dog lover and never understand the, say, um, uh, the sense of people with young children having nasty type bred dogs. Well, you see, I think a lot, of, lot to do with the, the violent dogs is not the dogs themselves, but the way they are brought up and trained by the owner. I actually believe a lot of the time these vicious, nasty animals are like that because the owner, for whatever reason, has decided to bring up a dog that is violent. I, I do blame the owner. I really do. Uh, my, um, my nephew and uh, his wife, they're, they're going to have the baby, uh, I think it's next month now, not long now. Um, they've got one of those, uh, what they call Rottweilers. And this thing is massive. And it is as placid as anything. You know, it just depends how that dog is trained and brought up. I think a lot of the time, and it's very sad, you know, having these dogs um, and, and they have to put them down because of the way they have been trained and brought up. You know, they're not like cats. I think dro dro dogs, not drugs, dogs are trained to be a certain way. Cats, you don't do anything with cats. They, they just live their damn lives as they want. My cat, Katie, for whatever reason, the last couple of weeks has become very, very touchy. You know, you may remember last year, she was quite happy to be picked up and strokes and always jumping on my lap and all that. Now, it's the weirdest thing ever. Now, sometimes I walk into the kitchen and she shoots out the cat flap. <laughs> like I've been mistreating her or something, and I haven't. And she does the same in the garden. Like, I picked her up the other day, and she's moaning and moaning. <laughs> Obviously wanting to get down. Oh, go on, get down then. Isn't it funny? I wonder what makes cats change like that. But they do. They decide what they want to do when they want to do it, cats. Dogs don't. I, I don't believe dogs do. Dogs do as they are trained to do. If you train a dog to be loving and kind and all that, it will be. If you train a dog to be vicious and to fight, then that's what it'll do. And a lot of the time, Phil, I do think uh, it is the owners who have done this. Phil says, I like the other idea you had about using Skype for Millie to join in your quiz night. I join in if you set up a conference uh, chat on Skype. Yeah, that's what we were able to do that in um, in the, uh, the place in Hammersmith where we were doing quiz night. But unfortunately, that was cancelled now. I'm now doing another quiz night on Tuesday nights at a place in uh, Rotherhithe in South East London, a lovely little pub called The Mayflower. Um, and it's right on the River Thames. If you ever want to uh, come down to that, if you're in the London area, The Mayflower, Mayflower Rotherhithe, right on the Thames on Tuesday nights at 8.30 p.m. You were talking about your teeth, Phil says. He says, too fake, they are a pain, but I have a problem tooth and find if I persevere with mouthwash, the pain goes away. No dentist needed, no bill. I like the sound of that. I had to laugh about the talking scowls you mentioned uh, on another show where it made comments if you were too heavy and the Wii Fit game where the character exploded. Yeah, that's true. That is true. I came across some of this a long, weeks and weeks ago. This is now. It just shows how far you are behind, Phil. Um, but someone, st <laughs> someone stood on one of those Wii Fit boards and they were so heavy that the character on the screen exploded. <laughs> And some naughty programmer having a bit of a laugh there. One final thing. Why are you veggie? Because I don't like to kill little animals without reason. That's why. Can't be. And you look at these little chickens and, and cows and pigs and things like that. Well, why? I just, no. Don't need to kill animals to eat. 
I feel sorry for him. That's why. He said, what's the point? It won't stop people eating meat. So if you can't beat them, join them. I don't know. I think that's completely the wrong attitude, Phil. Just because you eat meat doesn't mean I will. You know, how many vegetarians are there in the world? A sizable number, I would think. And we are growing in numbers. Come on, Phil. Next time you eat that pork chop, I want you to put that down on a plate and look at it. And I want you to see the terrified face of the little pig just before it is murdered. All right? See how you feel about that. You started it, not me. You started it. He says, P.S. These shows are, the longer shows are better, but the live shows you used to do, I could interact with Skype. Try from now, and that's from Phil. Phil, um, the thing is with the live shows, they were just a complete pain in the arse, to be honest, um, technically wise. There always seemed to be something going wrong. Um, so that's why I, gave, I got fed up trying to work it all out, you know. I've never really enjoyed the technical aspect of doing this stuff. Um, I, I just want to sit here and talk, you know, if, I, if, if someone came around and said, right, well, OK, Chris, you sit in the corner and talk, I'll work every, all the lights and everything else, I'd be so much happier, I really would. Thank you, Phil, OK? Um, hello to John Golding Galling, who says, yay, she's back. What do you mean, where's all this she coming from? That's what I want to know. Where's all this she coming from? She this and she that. Jesse BT says, well, I'm so glad you're doing better. You know, sometimes going back to work is just what the doctor ordered. Do what makes you feel joyful. Yeah, I, I can't. I'm, I'm not one of these people. I mean, you know, I rarely cancel work if I'm sick. If I've got a cold or something like that, I would still drag myself in. You know, for me to not go to work for 10 nights. Yeah, and it was all, and it's boring. Sitting at home is so boring, isn't it? American Cutie Pie says, welcome back, Chris. So glad to see you looking and feeling well again. Missed you so much. Hugs from Lisa. I'm running at about 75, 80% now, Lisa. I've got my fingers crossed that it's, it's a slow, slow recovery. Hello to Larry, who says, hi, Chris. Just wanted to say hello and glad to hear you're feeling better. My wife, Chris, was completely surprised when you read out my email. She is a new, they are new viewers, boys and girls, new viewers. I had not told her about it. She thought it was a coincidence and you were talking about someone else from South Ryslip until you mentioned my name and that I was from New York. Thanks again and we hope to see many more of your broadcasts. Larry, by the way, we now live in Fort Worth in Texas. Yeah, Texas. Texas, the home, of course, of Dallas. We are looking forward to the brand new Dallas TV series coming to your screen soon. I think, um, isn't it summer? I think we get it here in the summer. I think it's going to be on Channel 5 in the UK, if uh, my memory is not going to be on the BBC this time. It's going to be on Channel 5. Hello, it's Gary Owen. Hello, Gary, who says, well done with your show. I enjoy watching. Just wanted to know what camera you use and what mic. Well, uh, the camera is a Canon Legria FS200. OK, not particularly expensive camera. A little so Sony, um, Sony sort of tie clip microphone there. And the sound is recorded on a separate unit on this. This is a this is called you can you can see the little bits moving there. This is a was it Nag? Nagria. Nagria sound recorder, OK? So that's how the show comes together. And then I use a piece of software to pull it all together. Uh, Adobe Premiere Elements available. It's not over expensive, actually. It's only about 80 quid for that. It's a lot of new version out now. But I don't believe in upgrading software all the time, do you? You know, you could spend an absolute fortune upgrading your software all the time. Gary says, I was starting a short show for the town where I live in Wales soon. I need some advice. You're right about Wix too. Thick as shit. <laughs> From Gary. Well, they are, you know. You ask them a question in Wix, they haven't got a bloody clue what's going on, have they? Not a clue. 
Uh, Stacy writes, really enjoyed your show the other day, Chris. Totally agree with everything you said. Uh, we were talking about um, beliefs and what you are. For example, I mean, I said to you, I get fed up with the gay people that I know who criticise me for being a Catholic. Similarly, I get, I have to say, I, I'm not criticised at all, but sometimes you see other people who are criticised by Catholics or Christians because they are gay. I am both. I am both Catholic and Christian. And I don't see why people have to comment, you know, and they come out with usually I'm afraid, I'm afraid it's, it's, it's my fellow gay people that come out with the worst comments of it all. Like, oh, Catholic, oh, you must be sleeping with priests and all that sort of thing. You know, you, you just don't need to say that, do you? I think it's one of those cases where you need to keep your mouth shut. I really do. Rather than cause offence, which you actually do to me. I don't like my religion. Slated for whatever reason. Similarly, I don't like gay people slated by so-called Christians who are supposed to love everyone. You know? Stacy writes, My view is that God made everyone different. When the Bible was written, it was only male-female relationships that were really known. I believe our lives are already mapped out for us to a certain extent. And I certainly believe that if God is as great and mighty as we are led to believe, that his attitude towards things like gays, lesbians, would be up to date and living in 2012. I certainly don't think he would judge or stop anyone being Catholic or Christian because of their sexuality. People who think that need a big reality check. Well, this is the case, you see. I mean, you see some of these really, really strong um, Christian beliefs, I have to say, not really in the UK, but you often see them uh, in small villages and towns in America, where, where they come, and, and they really are, you know, it's a similar thing to like when, when they pick up copies of the Quran and start burning the Quran. Was, wasn't there some Christian bloke in, 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 in America who does this? Now, I'm not a Muslim. I told you, I'm a Catholic. However, however, I don't think anyone's got any right whatsoever to pick up the beliefs of another religion and do things like that or say nasty things about it. I really don't. On the other hand, there are times when little jokes are made. And I feel sometimes... These jokes are taken completely the wrong way by someone. Extremists or, or something like that. And I, you think to yourself, come on, take a chill pill. It's a joke. You know, I don't mind people joking about me being gay. I don't mind people joking about me being Catholic. But I do object to downright nasty comments. I really do. So thanks for that, Stacey. Appreciate that. Any more comments on that one? Let us know. Chris at unitedkingdomtalk.co.uk. Well, we're nearly out of time. I just wanted to mention uh, one other thing. Now, I, I thought I pulled it out of um, uh, the paper. Oh, we got, we got a brand new newspaper here in the UK, The Sun on Sunday. We do have the sun during the week, but they've launched on Sunday now. And I'm, I've got to say, they've got to be pretty desperate because guess who they've got written, writing as a common list? Bloody Katie Price. Are you having a laugh? I mean, they must be desperate for journalists to ask Katie Price. Oh, I get, do you know, I don't know what to say. I know she, she, they've got her on now as a columnist now. Katie bloody price, I ask you. Honestly, um, I don't know if I'm... And there was a picture also in, a, in, in the very first Sun on Sunday of Holly Willoughby. 
Christ. I mean, what does she look like? She's kind of trying to look sexy. She looks like the dog advert from Dulux. Not Durex, Dulux. You know the dog with the long hair? <laughs> she looks exactly like one of those. Or Dougal from the Magic Roundabout. And she's got this tight leather, I don't know what she's got on. Leather type thing on. Suppose, I suppose she's supposed to look sexy in that. I, she's not doing it for me, I'm afraid. Mojie, she's the wrong sex for me. Holly bloody Willoughby, honestly. How did she get those jobs? I dread to think. Um, maybe, maybe I haven't, I don't think I've taken out the page. But basically, it was to do with some of these companies... Uh, the government has got some sort of scheme now that people on benefits go and work for certain companies who have joined this scheme for their benefit money. They don't actually get paid the proper wage from the company. Now, I, I believe... Uh, I, I can't remember which company, one com uh, Burger King, that's it. Burger King, I believe, has pulled out of, uh, of this agreement with the government, right? And the idea was, if you want your benefits, you had to go and work for this company, do the job, and then you get your benefits. But it's not the same as getting a proper wage. And I think, I believe Tesco were involved with this as well. Don't quote me. I think it was Tesco as well. Uh, and I'm not sure if they've pulled out or not. But I think that's really wrong. I really do. Now, there are a lot of people on benefits in this country who shouldn't be. There's nothing wrong with them. They can work. That being said, there are also a few people, a few people who really cannot work. They cannot work through terrible sickness, uh, perhaps, I don't know, you know, pull something out of the air, terminal cancer or something like that. You wouldn't expect someone to work like that, just make them as comfortable as much. But there are so many people in this country who can work, who instead choose to sit on their lazy fat asses all day long watching daytime uh, television and eating bags of crisps. Now that to me is wrong. However, I don't believe these people should be working for their benefits for the benefit of a large multinational company like Tesco's or Burger King. I believe those two have pulled out of this now. I think that's very wrong. These companies should be taking on these people and giving them a job if there is a job available. And there must be. There must be. How can it be that the government is sending these people there? They are working for the company basically free of charge, right? For their benefit money. No. I do believe that these people should be forced to work for their benefits, but not in large multinational companies. They could be, for example, working for the council, perhaps doing... I don't know, painting fences, doing bits of council-type gardening, cleaning graffiti off walls, sweeping pavements. There's nothing wrong with any of these jobs. They are all jobs. You know, some people would say, oh, I'm not sweeping pavement, that's below me. No, no, it's not, not below anyone. I would sweep pavements. It is a job. A job is a job. If you've got a job, and I've had kids come up to me while I'm DJing and they say, oh, oh, I've got a new job, or what is it? Oh, no, no, it's, I can't tell you, it's embarrassing. No, go on, what is it, what is it? Oh, it's only at McDonald's. And I'm like, good, you've got a job, well done. Doesn't matter what it is, you've got a job. I believe the people who can work, who are on benefits, should do. But I do not believe that they should be working for their benefits for multinational companies who should be giving these people jobs and not getting them on the cheap. That's wrong. That's very wrong. They should be doing community type work, maybe painting council, council homes or something like that. And at the same time, possibly learning a skill. And then they can be paid their benefits for that. To do, see, to, to, to do with helping the community and not a large company has already got enough money as it is. What do you think of that?
people on benefits, make them work for their benefits, but do it as a like a, 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 a community thing working perhaps for the council. Maybe they can save us some money on our council tax as well by doing that. You know, your thoughts on that, please. My email address, chris at unitedkingdomtalk.co.uk. Time to go. Thanks so much for watching and listening to the show today. Uh, it'd be lovely to hear from you then. All right, see you on the next show. Bye-bye.